Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Besides investigating serious state capture allegations, Transnet is embarking on what it calls a Transnet 4.0 strategy. Terence Creamer joins me now to discuss what the strategy entails. Welcome Terence. Hi oh, Sam. Terence, although its financials have strengthened, Transnet has not escaped state capture scrutiny. That's right. I mean, it's half year in a very difficult uh, economic environment. We know that uh, the Minister of Finance indicated that South Africa is going to grow well below 1% this year. It's, we've sort of caught in a low growth trap at the moment. As an economy, many industries are taking a lot of strain. There's retrenchments underway. But Transnet actually, during this first half of its financial year, so their financial year runs from April, uh, on 1st of April to the end of March, in 2018, had a, a, a big uplift in profits, about 230% rise in profits, 3.4 billion rand. And uh, a lot of this is about capturing um, market share, but really much of the focus is on the other capture. And the issue of state capture at state-owned enterprises has been something overhanging this period at Transnet. Now, th uh, there is a process underway at a board level to investigate specifically the China South Rail contract where there have been serious allegations made about uh, commissions to middle, uh, middlemen linked to the Gupta family. But there have also been an, a series of other uh, um, allegations, you know, regiment which became Trillion, uh, worked for Transnet. Um, there's also this SAP, the uh, big IT company that has Transnet contracts. And SAP uh, gave an uh, update on its own investigations and what they've actually told the uh, US authorities to date, uh, where they've, they've found that in certain instances, middlemen were again linked to the Gupta family, were paid for both Eskom and Transnet work. So uh, um, Transnet has given the assurance that they are investigating all these allegations as they emerge and are making these uh, allegations known to the police as well. So they have an internal probes, um, the biggest one being around the CSR, and they've got a, a law, uh, law firm worksman onto that, and they expect by December there'll be some clarity. In the meantime, you know, we're still waiting for clarity on how the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture, whether that is ever going to be assembled by the President. There's a legal dispute about that. And uh, in, in Parliament, in parallel, there's this process that's now started with the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Public Enterprises now meeting and f with the initial focus being on very much on Eskom, but both Transnet and Denal's transactions are also come uh, to come under scrutiny. So I think uh, Transnet feels they, they're doing a lot, but it's possibly premature to say that, they are, that, that they're all in the clear. Transnet is also having to make adjustments for the weaker domestic economy. That's right. I mean, in 2012, when their former CEO, Brian Molefe, who's at the centre of these other allegations uh, in relation to Eskom and potentially the Ch China South Rail contract, uh, when he announced the market demand strategy, April 2012, there was a whole different uh, vibe around South Africa and its expected growth path. It was post the, the, the global economic crisis, but South Africa did come out of that crisis fairly well initially and we've now slumped back terribly uh, in the sort of later years after the crisis. So we've uncoupled from the rest of the world that is now growing again and we are in this very, this terrible trap, which was initially, I suppose, triggered by the, the collapse in commodity prices. Uh, and then we had the drought, but definitely now the big overhang is political. And until the politics in South Africa is sorted out, I think the confidence is gonna remain weak amongst investors and without investment we aren't going to have growth and without growth we're not going to have jobs so it's this vicious cycle that we're currently in but um, Transnet has had to adapt its plan so if you look at that 2012 plan it had massive volume uh, increases across coal, iron ore, manganese and the general freight business in particular. Now they are as I said earlier uh, capturing market share from road and are doing relatively well in this current context as these new, this new equipment, particularly on the rail, is, is entering the fleet is much more efficient. They're able to compete more strongly with road hauliers and they are capturing market share, but it's nowhere, nowhere near the sort of 2012 aspirations. You know, general freight, the aspiration was by this time or the end of this year to get to like 161 million tons. 
if transit gets to 89 or 88, that will be a, a good performance. So you can see it's, it's nowhere near those early aspirations and Transnet is having to adapt. And the main place where we see the adaptation taking place is around some of the big projects that had some really large, um, some of them are going to be done in conjunction with the private sector, but generally they had some large projects which have either been um, taken off the agenda or they've been delayed massively. So we don't hear any more about the Durban dig out port at the airport site really. That's a really been going to be pushed back massively. We are hearing about the Swazi rail link uh, to um, sort of liberate the coal line uh, of its general freight. So there is some progress there, but not at the sort of time horizons we initially expected. So it, there is a big rethink, I think, around capital program. And the, the, the word or the mantra at Transnet is only to pursue validated demand. So they have their market demand strategies uh, in place. But until they can validate that there is actually demand for these freight services, they're not going to be investing uh, at, at the pace that they initially said they were going to and the scale that they initially indicated. The group is attempting to look beyond the immediate horizon. So what are some of the short and medium term drivers? I think that is one of the things that holds Transnet separate at the moment from, say, the other state-owned companies, which are really just about putting out fires. Transnet has uh, is thinking strategy, is thinking strategically, and is creating space for itself to think strategically. And it's th it has come up with this uh, Transnet 4.0 strategy. It's very much trying to align the business to the fourth industrial revolution, that wave of digitalization that's hitting every industry, whether you're in the media or banking, but also freight logistics. And they are looking how they can do uh, do that digital overlay in a way that's going to be much more customer friendly. I think if they're wanting to capture market share from road in this very, very tough environment, it's all going to be about the customer and also partnerships, especially for the last mile. So Transnet's not really about the first or the last mile. So they need to make sure that deliveries, you know, they can deliver not just on those long corridors, but how does the customer feel at the end? The customer only is really satisfied when that. Uh, delivery is made. So there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of discussion around partnerships. They've set aside a 20 billion rand war chest for acquisitions. We haven't seen anything yet, but I think in the not too distant future we might start seeing some action on that front. And then obviously they're looking at, as everyone else is, at these so-called asset light investments. So looking at how you can put in digital systems that can you know, add tremendous value for the customer and for the business, you know, tapping into these massive data streams that Transnet has unique access to, its own, uh, it knows about its own data. It also has the, the railway network is overlaid with fiber, so it's got this massive uh, infrastructure, uh, RT infrastructure that uh, is, is associated with the business. And it's really about tapping into that. So that's the transport, Transnet 4.0 strategy and the initial target, and it's quite an ambitious one in the near term, is to become a 100 billion rand turnover business by 2020. It, it, it will need to do, it, it says without doing anything, it probably can get to the sort of 70, 80 billion rand level, so it needs to do more. And I think the initial focus on doing more, and these, this um, is not about revenues in the immediate horizon, but is on the African continent. So we've seen that Transnet is going to become much more assertive um, in pursuing opportunities. We know they're involved in a concession, in a uh, rail concession in uh, Nigeria, which is underway in terms of finalizing that. They're involved in Zimbabwe, Zambia. Uh, they also have a port type operational concession in Kenya coming up. So you can see that's going to be not so much in the immediate future in terms of the revenue, but it's going to be sort of money in, but uh, building a revenue pipeline around Africa. And then they also have the uh, rail um, engineering, or actually not rail, it's, it's Transnet Engineering, which is a rail and port equipment, uh, which is being converted into an original equipment manufacturer. They feel they have products that are very relevant to the, the railway networks and the ports, particularly of Africa, but also parts of Middle East and South America. And they're going to be far more aggressive in marketing some of those systems to the rest of the world. And they have some big uh, scale-up ambitions in terms of sales. Um, but it's all about getting those sales and 
getting them down on the board, uh, you know, signing them on the dotted line, and also the whole financing uh, arrangement around uh, these large ticket items. Uh, there's going, there is some work underway to try and work with a development finance institution like the DBSA to set up sort of financing schemes that are make it competitive when you come uh, when you come up against American or Chinese competitors in Africa that you come not just with your equipment that might be uh, world class but you need to have a world class financing package that makes it attractive to the buyer so I think that's also uh, on very much on the radar so I think um, definitely that would be the distinguishing feature of a Transnet versus an Eskom or Danau. There's definitely s uh, very much a strategic focus looking beyond the current clouds, looking beyond the current gloom. But obviously without getting over these allegations of corruption and, and capture, you know, the reputational damage to Transnet could be significant. So they have to deal with that as, as a top priority. Thank you, Terence. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.